There's very little in the Bible in the way of teaching about prayer. Many books that Christians have written about prayer, but there's very little in the way of specific teaching about prayer in the scriptures. There are many recorded prayers, besides the extensive collection of the Psalms, major part of our Bibles, many admonitions to pray, but very little in the way of specific instruction about how to pray. Even though prayer was so integral to the life of Jesus, he taught very little about prayer. He had very little interest in the how of prayer. He had no time for performative prayer, either mindless repetition to somehow impress God of your seriousness or ostentatious public display to somehow impress others of your righteousness. Wasn't interested in that. Find a quiet place, private place, close the door, talk to your father. Though Jesus had little interest in the how of prayer, he was emphatic about the need for prayer. Both in his own life and in his teaching, nothing got in the way of his times of prayer, his need for prayer. As busy and as demanding, as important as his life and ministry and mission were, nothing got in the way of that. Time and time again throughout the four Gospels, we're told that he would slip away from the demands to a quiet place, a solitary place, and he would pray. Oftentimes in the very early morning hours. Because you and I know that if there's something that has to be done, <laughs> that we want to do on a regular basis, first thing in the day is the best time. And he was there often. Sometimes at night. Sometimes all night. Luke writes these words, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and pray. That as aspect of his life was so significant and so pronounced that the disciples came to realize that they didn't really understand or comprehend his impulse for prayer. Even though they had been raised and steeped in a tradition of prayer. Isn't that interesting? They didn't share that same impulse. But at the same time, they recognized that it was at the very core of everything he was and everything he did. It was on one of those occasions when Jesus had been apart from them praying that when he had finished and returned to the disciples, they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. There was something Jesus knew about prayer that they didn't have a clue about. And they knew that. I can picture them saying to themselves, what in the world is he doing out there? Why is it taking so long? I mean, you know, Lord, thank you for the bounty of your good gifts. We bless him to our strengthening. We love you. Amen. <laughs> what could he be doing all night? There's something we're not understanding. Lord, would you teach us what you're doing? He said to them, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. He gives them the briefest, barest, most concise outline of prayer, so brief it's almost embarrassingly brief. 34 words, 
that prayed carefully, thoughtfully, take a mere 20 seconds to pray. He was giving them the bones of prayer. The bones of prayer. The essence. The core of what we pray. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say that in praying the Lord's Prayer covers everything that we didn't pray. Not prayer. Everything important. Be my one and only. Be to me everything that you should be to me. That's what we mean when we say hallowed be your name. May your name be holy everything in my life. Nothing comes close to competing you. May I do your will. Nothing else. May I live in daily dependence upon your daily provision. Forgive me as I forgive others. Deliver me from sin and evil. That's it. And then in Luke's account, he tells him a story, a parable. That parable is a part of a larger body of parables, all of which are part of a section of the Gospel of Luke that are known as the travel narrative. Ten chapters, right in the middle of Luke's Gospel, which begin with Jesus' departure from Galilee and end with his arrival in Jerusalem at the triumphal entry when he enters Jerusalem for the last time before the fateful week of his last week of life on earth. During which, in those ten chapters, as he leaves Galilee before he arrives in Jerusalem, he's involved in a series of conversations along the way with people in which he tells a series of stories, 11 in all, 11 parables. Interestingly, two of those 11 parables concern prayer, two of them. Apart from the bones that he gave them, those words that can be recited in 20 seconds, and his warning to avoid performative prayer, they constitute the only formal teaching of Jesus on prayer, those two parables. Both of the stories in similar but unique ways underscore the necessity of prayer. The first came shortly after he left Galilee. The second came shortly before he entered Jerusalem as if punctuation marks on that whole section. That prayer is not an option. It's fundamentally necessary. The first story underscores the need for persistence in prayer. A man has a friend who is on a journey. He shows up at his house unexpectedly at midnight. He has nothing in the way of food to offer him. His cupboards are bare. He wasn't prepared in a culture where hospitality is a given and to not provide it is simply unthinkable. Can't happen. Goes next door to his friend's house. Bob, Bob, wake up, Bob. Mom's coming out of his sleep. What, what, what is it that you want? What are you doing? What in the world? Are you nuts? Hey, my friend Smitty showed up suddenly and my cupboards are bare. I need some bread. He goes, man, my house is locked. The kids are tucked. They're asleep. I mean, what's, what's the unforgivable sin to wake sleeping kids? <laughs> Go away. <gasps> Bob, I need, the, <laughs> I need that bread. Bob comes to himself and realizes that if there's any chance of everybody in the house staying asleep, he better get up and as quietly as he can get that bread and give it to his friend. Because he's not going away. Then Jesus says it's not because of their friendship that he got up. 
It is because of his shameless audacity. That's the translation of the NIV. It's a word that is used only in the New Testament one time here. That's always a a matter of interest. The King James used to translate it importunity. That was the word. The word means literally shameless in the sense that you will not be denied. You are standing your ground. I tried to recall the occasion, and you might have to help me out on this, Trish, but when Jennifer was at the airport with seven or eight kids at that point, and she needed a particular document that they were going to require for her to have before they can get on that plane. I think she was in Mexico at the time. And she just stood there and said, I'm not leaving this window till you get me on that plane. I'm not going. And boy, there was a ruckus. Until they finally came to the conclusion, they came to the conclusion, she's not leaving. <laughs> and they said, uncle. That's, that's what the word means. It's that audaciousness to say, Bob, I'm not leaving this house until I have some bread. Paul was importune with his thorn in the flesh. He went to God and said, God, I need this removed. Please. No answer. He went back to him again and said, God, I, I'm going to reiterate my request. I need this thorn removed. He went a third time. He would have kept going. He would not stop. But after the third time, God says, Paul, I've heard your request. The answer is no. This is good for you. Case closed. But if he had not gotten that specific answer, he would have kept going. But it never stopped. God chose not to take it away, but it was not because of Paul's lack of asking. Jesus then says, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. The implication being, you don't ask, you don't receive. You don't seek, you don't find. You don't knock, the door's not open. You don't pray, you don't receive. You do not have because you do not ask. James writes. Here's the first lesson in prayer. It's an important lesson. Get your pencil handy, paper handy. Here's the first lesson. We need to pray. We need to pray. Because if we don't pray, we won't receive. That's why prayer is a necessity. That's why it is not optional. Pretty obvious, pretty basic, pretty clear, pretty emphatic. The second story underscores, if the first story underscores the need for persistence in prayer, the second story underscores the need for perseverance in prayer. In fact, Luke clearly states the purpose of the parable at the very beginning. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. There was a widow without friend or family member. In the ancient world, that was the epitome of powerlessness, the epitome of vulnerability. The weakest, the most vulnerable. She had been defrauded of her property, They were often the victims of those 
scrupulous people like the telephone people that will call senior citizens to extort money out of them. How can, I just think, how in the world can your conscience be that seared? They were so vulnerable that they were often the victims of fraud, and she was. Her only recourse was to take her case to the local judge because there were laws against that. The judge, however, could care less. He could care less about God, he could care less about people, and therefore he could care less about justice. Some kind of judge. And therefore he could care less about her. And he simply refused to hear her case. Didn't want to be bothered. But he was her only prayer. And so she kept after him. She came back. She came back before him. She came back before him. She came back before him again. She followed him. She followed him to his house. She knocked on his door. She knocked on his door during dinner. She pestered him in the street and at public places where he was at. He was an ornery, stubborn old coot, and her pestering just steeled his resolve. But she kept on. She would not be denied. And eventually that pestering wore him down. The word he uses to describe himself is literally bruised or pummeled. The cost to maintain his honoriness and stubbornness had simply become too great for him. And though he could care less about God, public opinion, because I'm sure there were people who were giving him an earful about it, or justice, he gave her justice. Just to put an end to the pummeling. Where I grew up, we say he cried uncle. Why? Because she wasn't going to quit. She was not going to quit. She wasn't going to give up. God is not what the judge was to that widow. That's not God in the story. In fact, God is everything the judge is not. That's why the parable is told, as Jesus tells it, to provide that stark contrast. The judge is, God is, I'm sorry, God is everything the judge was not. He not only cares about God, which the judge didn't, he is God. And he cares deeply about us. Deeply. And since he is God and since he cares deeply about us, he cares deeply about justice. The more vulnerable, the more powerless, the more needy, the more he cares. Read your Old Testament. Read your Old Testament. Read the prophets, that section of your Bible that is often the least worn. Read it. He cares about the weak and the vulnerable and justice deeply because God is God and because he cares about us deeply beyond what we can comprehend he cares about justice so God is not what the judge is to the widow but listen to this we are to God what the widow was to the judge in the parable we are to God what the widow was to the judge powerless Helpless, needy, without anything. He's our only prayer. We have no one else and we have nothing else. We need him. We need him desperately. We have nothing apart from him. We have what apart from him? We have nothing apart from him. Do you doubt that? 
But be honest. Be honest. Be honest with yourself. Well, not nothing. I mean, I got something. I want God's blessing just like the next guy. But I'm not nothing. <laughs> I've worked hard. I'm something. I'm actually pretty good. I mean, I, whatever he wants to add to that, I'll take. But I'm pretty good. Oh, really? Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus pray? Why did Jesus pray? Why did he pray so often? Why did he pray so much? Why did he pray for so long? That's why the disciples were scratching their heads. Why was prayer never an option for him? Why did he never allow anything, no matter how important, to deflect him from that? That's what the disciples wanted to know. What's the answer to that? Do you know? What answer would you give? Let me read some excerpts from Eugene Peterson because... He says it so well. When Jesus took on full humanity, he set aside the privileges of deity. That's Philippians 2, isn't it? He didn't come in the form of a superhuman. He came in the form of a human flesh. And not just a human flesh, a servant. Peasant parents nursed by a poor young mom. That's the epitome of vulnerability, isn't it? He didn't come as a superhuman with super powers and abilities of his own. He did, he, but, but he experienced the poverty of human existence more deeply and more excruciatingly than any other man. He became absolutely poor, of no account. The servant songs in the prophet Isaiah, nothing that we would desire in him. Absolutely poor. That's why in his humanity, he could say with all truthfulness and honesty, very truly I tell you, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He was dependent upon the Father for everything. Did you hear what he said? What can he do apart from the Father? Nothing. And then these words. In so doing, he showed us how to become complete human beings. That was his intent. We do it the way Jesus did it, by becoming absolutely needy and dependent upon the Father. Only when we stand emptied, stand impoverished before God, can we receive what only empty hands can receive. We are all beggars. Father, give us bread. Friend, lend me three loaves. That's what we forfeited in Eden. That's what we forfeited. We would have lived forever in absolute dependence upon him. We chose to go our own way. Our resources, our ability... And death was born. Jesus came back to restore what we had then. 
absolute dependence upon God, by becoming what we were meant to be. In order to restore humanity. When he prayed, when he prayed often, when he prayed long, when he prayed emphatically, he wasn't just going through the motions for our benefit. He was really, truly dependent, wholly upon the Father for everything. And like him, he later tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do what? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. We need him. We need him for everything. We need his strength. We need his wisdom. We need his guidance. We need his direction. We need his provision. We need his protection. We need his help. We need his power. We need his deliverance. We need his intervention. He is I am. He's everything. Who shall I tell them sent me? Tell them I am sent you. I'm everything. Moses, whatever you need, just second, God, I can't handle this. I can't. Listen, Moses, I am. Whatever you need, I am. But there's a converse truth. I am not. I am. I am not. I am. I am not. He is everything I need. I am nothing of what I need. I just read this this week again. It was a, in my devotional time, it was, a, it was just a, such a poignant reminder. The only failure of the initial conquest of the promised land under the leadership of Joshua and the others that were leaders for the people of Israel was the result of a failure to pray. The Gibeonites who... The children of Israel were to conquer and destroy, just like all of the other people that lived within the confines of the promised land, came up with a genius idea, a ruse, it's called. They knew they had no ability, that these people were going to conquer them, and they didn't have a chance, and you know where. And so they came to the Israelites, remember in the story, And they tell them, listen, we're a people from a long ways away. We've heard what wonderful things and miraculous things that God has done. We know that there's nobody who is going to stand against you, and we want to make a treaty with you. We're from a long ways away. But in order to convince them, remember in the story, they've they've, they've got old crack wineskins, and and they're dusty, and they're covered, and their clothes are worn out, and their sandals are, are... tied together to hold them together. They look like they've been on the road for years. The Israelites sampled their provisions and then these words. But they didn't inquire of the Lord. (laughs) I thought of the many decisions that I have regretted that we're not bathed in prayer. That didn't have the stamp of his yes. But 
but it's what I was determined to do. We need him. I need thee every hour. That's what I am apart from him. Jesus, on the night before he chooses the 12 disciples, spends the entire night in prayer. We don't even know prior to that that he even had a notion or a thought that he was supposed to call disciples. We don't know that. It wasn't his ingenuity. It wasn't his plan. It wasn't his decision, if we're going to make this mission go on after me, I'm going to choose. He spent a whole night in prayer, and it was at the end of that night of prayer that he goes and calls the disciples. And the 12 that God called them to call. Including Jews. That was part of that prayer. And when Judas went south, Jesus never had to look over his shoulder and say, that was a bad decision. Ah! Blew it on that one. No, because it was bathed and steeped in prayer and originated in God himself. Never, he never had to look back. God knew what he was doing. He is everything I need. But there's a reverse side to that coin, an important one. He delights in meeting our every need. He delights. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I was working in Baghdad for Lieutenant General Frank Helmick. You know what one of his greatest joys and delights were? that his position and his rank gave him the ability to do the right thing when he needed to do it, whatever it was, in any way that would help and benefit the most people without having naysayers on the sidelines saying, you can't do that. He was one of the most selfless people I know. His greatest joy in serving at that level was to be able to do that. Not for his benefit. He didn't get any thrill out of just being able to snap his fingers as if having that kind of power and influence stroked his ego. It wasn't that. It was the ability to do that when there was a need and he could make a difference. There's a, those are two different things. You know that. I'll never forget we were, um, we were shortly into our... Uh, our time there and our chapel was bursting and God was descending and it was amazing. And we had this enormous choir and musicians and the music was just startling and, and things were rocking and rolling spiritually. And we showed up one Sunday at the dining facility which was converted into the chapel on Sundays and our sound system was not there. No sound system. Couldn't plug in the, the instruments. Couldn't, couldn't do anything. Well, the G6 had confiscated the sound system that was ours on Sunday morning for some other mission, some other purpose. General Hellman came up to me afterwards and he said, what, what happened? And I said, you know, you don't want to tell on somebody, but I said, they confiscated our, our sound system. <sighs> and the next week we had a brand new, how, how'd they get it? I mean, I don't know where that came from, but it was brand new, state of the art, plus up for us, and it was ours. And he did that with pure joy, pure joy. If that crusty old honorary judge could say, oh, give her justice. 
If that selfless leader could say, what about our God? Do you think he gets thrill out of blessing us and about meeting our needs? Prayer is grounded in two profound convictions. The depth and degree of our need. The faith that is the confidence and trust in God's ability and propensity to meet that need. Which means that our greatest need is to know how great our need. And second, to know God's desire and delight in meeting that need. Here's the second lesson of prayer. The first lesson we need to pray. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is we can't quit. can't give up. We just can't. The only reason we would, I'm convinced, is because we really think we don't need to. We'll be okay. It'll be all right. That's the only way that other things can get in the way, is if we think, you know what, not going to matter today. If we truly believe it matters, if we truly believe that if we do not ask, we will not have, we will not let anything get in the way. That'll be the most important thing we do. Nothing will keep us from that. Jesus didn't. He did not. No matter how busy, no matter how many people waiting to be healed, they came... Lord, they're they're in line. They're stacked up. Yeah, they're in line. I got to pray. Can't skip that. The early church didn't. They would have considered that the epitome of presumption. When the burgeoning needs of the growth came and there were the need for Hebrew widows Greek-speaking widows to be fed, and the demands, the pastoral demands became too great. They saw that for what it was, the ploy of our adversary to deflect them from the two important priorities from which they could not be deflected, and the first was prayer. We will appoint, you bring them to us, we will appoint others to help care for the needs in order that we can give ourselves to prayer. That's number one in the ministry of the word. Paul exhorted us to pray without ceasing. And at the end of that marvelous section in Ephesians 6, in which he lays out this beautiful picture of the armor of God that we believers need to wear, He then wraps it all up with these words and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Listen for the all. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. What John Bunyan called all prayer. John Wesley said prayer is not the preparation for the work. It is the work. We need to pray. We can't quit. If prayer is necessary, and it is, then we can and should assume that it will be a primary target of our adversary. 
If you've got a principal weapon on the battlefield, what's the adversary going to go after? They're going to go after that principal weapon. We can assume that prayer will be the target of the adversary. That will be our subject next week. Next week. But know that if we need to pray, we can't quit. And he's going to spare no effort in trying to keep us from that. That little device you have in your hand or in your pocket or in your purse is amazing. What an amazing piece of technology. What a tool. What an incredible tool. It is also an incredible distraction. And we need to master it. Because there is no doubt in my mind that it wants to master us. Flip it over. Don't look at the screen. Turn off the sound. Turn off your messages. I'm not available. Because I have an appointment. And I don't want that appointment being intruded by others. That frustrates you? When you with somebody else and they've got a oh, excuse me. Is that frustrating? Rude? Oh God, hang on. Got to take this. No, it can wait. I've, I've battled that. I'm a news junkie. I'm a political junkie. I'm near political junkie anonymous. <laughs> that stuff can get me. Been that way since I was a kid. I've had to repent a number of times. So you know what? I want the first word I hear in the morning to be your word. Oh, just a quick look while the coffee's brewing. And then you're sucked in. Then your mind and your thoughts are at a different place. No. The first word's going to be your word. All right. Here are four questions to conclude for us this morning. Is prayer a necessity for you? Is it your first and foremost necessity that no one and nothing can keep you from? And are you prioritizing it as such? So number one, is prayer a necessity for you? Number two, is it your first and foremost necessity? Number three, would those who are close to you be convinced that it is a necessity for you? Would those close to you say that prayer is to you what the disciples understood that it was to Jesus? The fourth question is from Jesus himself, not me. He concludes his story with an aphorism. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find men and women still praying because they know that they are nothing without him, that he is everything we need, and that we are absolutely, entirely, utterly dependent? upon him. That may be the most important question of our day. 
Would you bow your heads with me? Well, I just want to give us a moment of quiet to allow the, the Lord to search our hearts. Speak to us. We have so much Dear Father, you know, we're blessed, blessed beyond measure. But that so much can become such an impediment to the living of our lives in ways that would be pleasing to you in many ways. Hospitality to others, sharing of our time, as well as our resources, but not least in this most important activity on earth. So we thank you for our gifts. We bring them back and lay them at your feet. We want you to use them for your good and for your glory. We want you to help us to order our lives in the way that we Manage and take care of those possessions in a way that would be honoring to you and conducive to the furtherance of the kingdom by people who love you and who live in utter dependence upon you and pray. We were birthed, this little congregation in prayer, and uh, we need to continue to pray. Help us to do that. Thank you in those months of our confinement when we gathered um, via Zoom to just pray each week out of our isolation. Thank you for the many answers to prayer that we saw and the confirmation of the words that we were reminded of again today. If we ask, if we seek, if we knock, Encourage us in that. We have had answers to prayer even in these recent weeks and months. Prayers long prayed. Those should be such an encouragement to us to keep on, to not quit. So help us to do that. In faith, we pray. And help that to be the foundation of everything that we, that we are. May it all be birthed in you through prayer. In Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This bread is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this as often as you will in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Drink this as often as you will in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and in fellowship with him and in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, then he invites you to sup with him and he with you. The Lord meets you, the Lord bless you, the Lord fill you and strengthen you as you do by his glorious means of grace in his name.